And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple. Come on. A man who fortunately does not have to play time zone tango with me with me. A rare situation as as it is. The one and the creator of the upcoming Swords and Spaceships. The one and only James Morris. How you doing today, man? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on. Thank thank you for thank you for coming on and wor and working around our respective crazy ass um schedules. Oh um, yeah, thank you for uh rescheduling me with me when I had that work accident and uh you know it's it's great to see that someone else is having a what did you call it the uh the home of a shit show I, I feel <laughs> like that's my life sometimes um Murphy's Murphy railed where you were going <laughs> yeah, but I'd like to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. With then, that, yeah, w I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? Oh, just in general, how I was introduced to role-playing games. Yes. So, um... It really started as something to do with my brother and dad. Uh, I don't know how old I was at this point. And we found a gaming group. And uh, my first tabletop game was a Pathfinder game with a guy that... Uh, he was a really good DM at the time, and rules were pretty much suggestions to him. And uh, it was just more about enjoying the game. And so... Uh, I played a, a half-orc fighter named Grawl, who uh, later gained the nickname Grawl the Book Slayer, because in our first few sessions, we wound up going to this library, underground library, and um, the books were all... I don't remember what they were called, and I don't want to call them mimics, because I don't think that's right, but they were all living books and tried to eat us. So I just had this, like, barely intelligible half-orc uh, killing the love out of all these books. Uh, I got banned from every library on the continent as a result. Uh, <laughs> but it, it was... It really struck me just how much freedom and character you can put into these tabletop games, especially when you're not as hammered down by each and every tiny detail of the rules because i've played a number of games at this point and i usually end up playing um you know system hopscotch where we'll very seldom play one system uh two games in a row the longest standing for me is pathfinder the one i started with um but yeah just Bouncing around and getting these really, I feel, unique characters and opportunities to tell a story that, uh, you know, unlike a movie you can participate in, unlike a video game you don't have certain constraints in. Like, I know for me, I always like the idea of, okay, how can I put down some sort of roots or build up a base, whether that's a car, a boat, a spaceship, uh, a house for real. And what sort of companions, not necessarily through something like the leadership uh, feat, but just through gameplay and forming relationships in the setting. 
what companions and relationships can I grow and how can they ultimately impact the greater story and just the consequence and everything that can happen to it really just sucked me into the medium. Mm-hmm. Now, as I now um, swords and spaceships, which I do want to give my congratulations for managing to get um, fun for managing to get funded in about a day. Thank um, you very much. Yeah, it was a uh, it was really exciting for us when uh, I checked it about twenty hours in, and we were at a hundred and two percent or something like that. And I'm like, wait, what? Really? So it was a it was a very pleasant surprise. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, you always hope, and uh, I know it's a a relatively low target number that we were shooting for, but it still is exciting that I believe at the end of the campaign, sixty six people funded it, got us over three hundred percent funded, and knowing that there's sixty six other people out there excited for the ideas behind the project. It it really just such an amazing feeling and revs up the uh, the desire and the energy to work on the project more than ever. Mm-hmm. Now, with the, now since since the vibe that the vibe that I got with Swords and Spaceships was was very space opera and. I'm cur- I'm curious cuz when cuz whenever whenever there's the topic of space opera um there's all there's always the question of of whether or not some whether or not somebody got introduced to it through the usual channels or something else. So the um the elephant in the room that I have to address in that regard is was your introduction to spa- to space opera a more um wars e fashion or was it so- or was it some other medium? I was introduced to the space opera in kind of a staging way in that I lived near a science center when I was little and so we'd go relatively often and I just fell in love with space in general or I guess at that time I'd only sort of had an interest in it Uh, but then you know when I was young the first sci-fi book I read was Ender's Game and I just started consuming more and more space information, science fiction information. I mean, I'm a total sci-fi fantasy nerd. I, I don't think anyone uh, in this discussion or listening to it can really deny their own status uh, of being a sci-fi fantasy nerd. But yeah, I Ender's Game is where I started my science fiction journey, and my parents were big Star Trek fans, so we wound up watching some of that and Star Wars and... A lot of the usuals, um, I'm not even sure what the unusual channels necessarily may be, or maybe coming in through a science center and Ender's Game is the unusual channel, uh, and it just doesn't seem that way to me. Mm-hmm. And I will admit that the reason why I phrased that, que- that question in that regard is for a, whole ge- for a whole generation, their introduction to space opera was Star Wars. I'd say for two I'd say for two whole generations. But that's not to say right, that's and not the only that's not the only instance. Um at least for at least for me it was I had a bit of a um I had a bit of I had a bit of a weir- a weird introduction through a co- through a combination of some 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 of the more science fictiony cartoons I I grew up with in the nineties and uh-huh. A um art and a art book I stumbled upon called the Terran Trade Authority. Interesting. I've I've never heard of that one. Yeah, it's um, it was it was written unlike a lot of art books. It was written in a very in-universe style. Oh, very cool. What what with all what with all of the ships all, and a lot of, a lot of them being a lot of them being haulers. It was it was de- it was definitely a very pulpy kind of de- kind of design. Right. Um, I still wish I had that book. I missed that one. Just picked one up the other day. I can't even remember what it's called anymore. Um, hold on, it's on my shelf, and I have a wireless headset, so I could walk over to it. <laughs> um, okay, I got two art books. One is called "Whoosh" by Lauren Wood. It's uh, I think if I don't 
if I'm remembering correctly, Lauren Wood worked on, um, um, oh my god, Borderlands. Mm. Uh, and it's all their, like, doodles of spaceships. And I got one called Structura, uh, by Sparth, who I think worked on Assassin's Creed and Halo, and just the sci-fi art in them is awesome. So, Mm -hmm. you gotta love it all. Oh, yeah. Oh, of course. Um, even if, even, well, not ev- not everything regarding Halo. I mean, I'm still, I mean, there's still a special place in hell for whoever created Jackal Snipers. Yeah, I, uh, my little brother and I had tried, um, Outriders recently, and we got some Jackal Sniper PTSD with the, uh, the snipers in that game, where it's just, oh, look, you exist. Die. Yeah. It, it's, uh... <laughs> It's an experience that, uh, why? Which, if I think about it, um, I don't individually like sniper rifles in a lot of games where I feel it really changes the flow of things. We have them in swords and spaceships because you sort of have to in the modern day and age, but I wonder if that preference originated with, uh... You know, the Jackal Snipers back on the Xbox just doing bad things to young me. Yeah, yeah, and, um, I, I think, it, I think, I think any, I think anybody who dives deep into gaming will have a few masochistic tendencies. Well, I, 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 how dare you suggest that uh, there's a huge player base for uh, Dark Souls and Fury and Cuphead? Oh please, and... I was I'm not even go. I'm not even going with that. I'm going even fur- I'm going even further back. Who do you take me for? I was... <laughs> no, I, no, I'm saying that I'm saying that this go this goes this goes all the way back to the NES era. Nintendo hard is a is a thing. And what this... about the Tomb of Horrors? There's a different level of masochism. <laughs> yeah, although. I have gone on record as as saying that I find Tomb of Horrors to be the most overrated module of old school D and D. I'll admit I have not played it. I've just played with people that seem to be traumatized by it. Oh, it de- it definitely is something that can that can provoke nom flashbacks. I'm not going to deny <laughs> that. But I do th- I do think that it's I do think that it's that the way it the way it sets up its difficulty is a, is a case of. Um, just throwing everything at the wall and seeing what sticks. I give it a little bit of Go slack ahead. because pe- because it was in, it was during that time when people were trying to figure out what the hell they're doing. But when I think when I th- we're not when, out of that time yet, huh? We're not out of that time. Not complete. Um, <laughs> jury's uh, jury's out on that. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll just. You know, I'll be in the corner over here. No one look at me trying to figure out what I'm doing. Still, uh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm. I'm fully aware of the irony of, uh, especially when I've said that the greatest innovations were done by people with no clue. But, but when it comes to difficulty, I don't. I don't. A lot of people will bring up. Um, will bring. Will bring up the Souls games. Although I'll give you credit for bringing up Fury. That's re- That's really good. Um, I love that one. Have you played the uh, the follow up Haven? Yeah, it's definitely interesting. Cool. I like uh, their art style and the storytelling. Yeah. Um but when it but my but my my but the things that will always come to mind for me when it comes to dip, when it comes to um that kind of masochistic levels of difficulty is is stuff like the original Mario 2. Not the not the one that we played on the NES as kids. The one that would eventually become Lost Levels, ah, or, um, or the Plutonia Experiment expansion for um, Doom Two. Okay. Which okay. In bo- which um in the ca- in the case of Plutonia, that was in, that was designed to be hard to be hard as balls. <laughs> um. Of course, yeah, stuff, that that tracks. <laughs> of course, there's stuff like ghosts and goblins, or the or trying to do legendary with Halo Two, or um, my brother Zan has tried to try to do a lasso run with Halo Two, and he has ne- and he has never um forgotten that. 
Okay. Or, or we can look at the final boss of difficulty, uh, having a consistent schedule to tabletop with your friends. I've 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 been I've been fortunate with with that, but I get I get the feeling it's because of the fact that um, I have to wonder if some of my players look at me like look at me like I'm like when I'm DMing I'm slowly morphing into a drill sergeant or something, <laughs> which I'm not I'm not I am I do not I do not sustain myself on that much misery. No, but you just have your own nom flashback. Just no, we are not missing another session. You will be on here. Saturday at 7 p.m. or I will drive to your house somewhere across the nation and kick your ass. Um, I have I have threatened people with the pain glass. That if they that if they're late, they have to drink the pain glass. What is the pain glass? It is a shot glass full full of water as water as a base, salt, sea salt, vinegar, Tabasco sauce, Frank's red hot sauce, tiger sauce, sriracha. And ground up jalapeno seeds. This okay. The pin glass is an apt name. That it, no, no. <laughs> it is e you either you either go with that or you have to drink a bottle of bacon soda. Neither sounds like a great option. <laughs> well, of course not. It's supposed to inflict pain. Okay, fear the pain glass. Mm hmm. And the thing, and the thing is, you get now. Obviously, I get, I give people, I'll give people like a cup, like a cup of yogurt or something after the fact, so that so that they don't die. But <laughs> well, that's considerate of you. It's the pain glass, not the murder glass. Mm -hmm. um, if I if I wanted if I wanted that if I wanted the murder part, I'd just have them read a Russian novelist. Okay. <laughs> but. When, but um, getting getting to saner matters when it comes to when it comes to swords and sp and um, spaceships. Um, yes. I look at I look at the I look at the setup that you have, and I and I, for one, I get a very pulpy vibe from things. But two, I do find it interesting that you focused on just one on just one system, or just one star system, I should say. Instead, yes. Instead of because a lot. A lot of um, a lot of space opera games and media in general like to focus on either the whole of the galaxy or one quadrant of the galaxy, but instead, you're, instead you're focusing on just one solar system. Yes. So that is not to say that the game is limited to the one solar system, the Gale system. Mm -hmm. Um. But it is where I wanted to focus the books inherent uh knowledge in uh and i've gone through a couple iterations of um sort of the history of everything uh that comes into this solar system i think i accidentally i not accidentally i think i called it oops the history of spacefaring in my first two drafts um and since then, the game has gone through a bunch of revisions. But I, I took a lot of things that I'd seen in science fiction, and I'd wanted to leave a lot up to the individual DMs, because I know whenever... Or overlords, as we call them. Um, whenever I play a game, we tend to build our own world, essentially scrapping whatever the game provides. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to be able to give players a look at potentially how to build a play space or if they wanted the gale system to be a part of their world it can be just one small little corner and everything else happens elsewhere or maybe you're on the opposite side of the galaxy or maybe you love mass effect and you want to throw in relay type objects and the gale system is basically like your citadel mm -hmm. um so that's why we chose to focus in on just the one, and we can talk potentially about uh, the relationships between the planets a little bit more. But at the same time, uh, I've chosen to write about the planets in a way that I think, personally, is... Uh, I don't want to say a unique take on it, but 
we we looked at the worlds and said every planet has two perspectives on it the spacefarer's perspective mm-hmm. and the planetary dweller's perspective so let's take star wars one of the biggest things that gets people into sci-fi right now mm-hmm. and you've got the forest moon endor the ice planet hoth the uh handful of desert planets that we've got and i we wanted to ask how do you justify saying this is an ice planet a jungle planet a desert planet an ocean planet and our answer to that is that is the spacefarer's perspective there are uh one to three major port cities uh in each world and that is essentially how the spacefarer sees it. Kind of like if you're uh, on a long road trip and you just stop on the edge of somewhere because you need a motel for the night or you're getting lunch or gas. You only get this very limited snapshot of the city you're seeing or the country you're in or whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's how we've got our version of you know the rust world the ice world the river world uh and because that's the way the spacefarers see it and we've left the planetary perspective the greater detail up to the individual overlords to fill in so that you know if your player wants to be from uh varlis is our earth-like planet so if you've got only one player from varlis then they can talk about their city their country their continent whatever it may be uh, so long as it doesn't contradict the ports that the spacefarers know it's all clear it's all good to go Mm -hmm. now Given the fact that you're, de- given the fact that we're dealing with, um, we're dealing with a science fiction setting, which I have, so I have somewhat nicknamed creating science fiction settings as a series of questions with yourself. <laughs> um, one of the big, que- one of the big questions that com- that comes up is the is the is the position of humanity. With it, with it, within the setting, because in some cases they're they're a they're a major player. In some cases they're they're significantly less so. Um, where does where does where does humanity fit in the Gale system? So, I uh, even before starting this, uh, so I I do novels as well, and um, you know I'll admit a couple years ago. Uh, for whatever reason, I decided to write a um, basically a chapter, a um, a pitch chapter to deal with a breakup, mm-hmm. and I I put a couple jokes from that in the book that nobody but me will get, but I think they're hilarious. Um, and I had the thought in that pitch chapter of why are humans always either the top or bottom of the totem pole in most things that we see. So I had a, the character was drinking at a bar, and to his left was a race stronger than humans, you know, just overwhelming to them. And on the right, there's a race that, for whatever reason, human saliva was toxic specifically to them. Mm -hmm. So the irritable character threatens to spit on them. Um and I kind of wanted to bring that idea back in with Swords and Spaceships, where we're firmly in the middle. I don't have a, you know, race where human spit is toxic to them again at this point. Uh, but the way that the Gale system looks at it is, this is the origin system for two of our races, actually. And since I'm terrible at naming races, uh, if anybody has suggestions, let me know. We've got the humans and what we've just been calling our bugs all through development, which are a um, little taller than humans and either have four arms or a pair of wings and look kind of like insectoid. Mm-hmm. Uh, they kind of came up together, but separate. And so they're, they are the first meeting uh, of an alien species for our humans. 
And so I have to tell a lot of the book's perspective from the human viewpoint because I've also chosen to write it uh, not as an overview of everything and being very cold and analytical. I mean, there is cold and analytical parts because I have to give stats and sales blocks and everything. But it also, there's some sass and character in the book. And so it's almost like a human jotting it down. So mm -hmm. there may be a bit more human bias there, but I'm human as far as I'm willing to admit or personally know. Uh, so you're going to see them fitting into a galactic community, uh, but also spreading out to the point where the human's racial ability, if I'm remembering it correctly, uh, we called it any port in a storm. And that's that humans uh, can essentially talk themselves into any port or stronghold that isn't inherently hostile to them. Uh, and that can be either because humans work there, or uh, humans are trusted, or maybe they just go, oh, look at the cute little puppy thing, let it in. So I didn't want to put them on either end of the food chain, but just as a community member. All right, all right, I can go with I can go with that. Um, given what you mentioned about about the about the get about the about the game not necessarily being limited to the Gale system, that brings me to the question of how do you ha how do you handle um, interplanetary and possibly interstellar travel if that if that's a thing. It is so. Uh, I think all but. The one to three of our spacefaring vessels uh, can jump through space, you know, using warp technology, slipstream technology, anything to avoid having to figure out how to work the theory of relativity into a tabletop game. Uh, and so we have a table that we've simplified. In fact, let me flip through the book really quick and I can tell you exactly how it works. Um, no, that's combat, that's cars, those are spaceship weapons. Yeah, don't worry about me, I'm humble. Okay, here we go. Um, our super, super, super simple is an inner system travel, so if you wanted to fly around um, the Gale system, it's 1d10 days to get to your destination planet. If you're going to travel on the same world, so let's use Varlus again. If you want to get somewhere on Varlus, it's 1d10 hours to fly. If you're flying to a neighboring system, it's 2d10 days. Or um, we have a basically skill check table that I actually need to redo now that I'm looking at it. If you're flying to elsewhere in the void, and this can be the opposite side of the galaxy, it could be three systems away, it depends on your piloting skill. Mm -hmm. uh, the faster paced game is 4d10 days, uh, or if you use our table that I have to revamp, it is between one day and ten months. Depends on your ship and your pilot. Yeah. Um, so we try not to make it uh, difficult to get places, but because we want role-playing to be an emphasis, and we are including uh, a slower rate of healing for characters and uh, lingering wounds is, I believe, the term we settled on, mm -hmm. um, those travel times give you that opportunity to lick your wounds and come back to full. Yep. Now... When it come when one of the thing one of the things that I did that I did notice on the Kickstarter page was yes. the was the emphasis on um on we on weaponry on weaponry and the customization therein. Um, yes. Since you mentioned since you mentioned Borderlands earlier earlier on, I get the feeling that was an influence. But talk to me about um about the potential for weapon modding within the, within your system. Sure. So in our base rules, we have... Uh, let's just look at the guns, not the melee weapons. Um, we have six 
weapon types, in essence. Uh, normal pistol, an SMG, a what we're calling hand cannon because I played too much Destiny for a while there, uh, an auto rifle, a shotgun, and a sniper. And each of these come with a uh, amount of mod slots. And we have a list of 50 modifications. I think it's actually exactly 50 right now just for the guns that you can use to craft your, in a sense, iconic weapon. Because I kind of, I don't know about you, but I get a little annoyed when I try to write a story for my character. And it's like, okay, and this was my father's sword, and that thing just dropped a plus one. Goodbye, Dad's sword. This is now a magic plus one thing that I have for no additional fee. So in this way, you can keep that, pistol your your armaments that you have the entire lifespan of your character and modify them to fit the situation or just grow them into something unique so um you know and i thought of things like i'm gonna use star wars again han's blaster and chewie's bowcaster you mm -hmm. can't really see them separate from those uh generally speaking so i wanted players to be able to have their special blaster and they can name it you know uh and i'm let's use destiny because i brought that up like Cade mm -hmm. always having ace on his side so it's just an opportunity with our current 50 mods and you know hopefully there's enough love for the project that we get the opportunity to do um expansions and we want to add more weapon mods more races more to the galaxy uh with e each expansion so it's not just here's a tiny bit more rules but let's grow everything a little bit for you um i think it is inevitable that somebody's going to take the mod setup and, and ask how can i use this to make the bfg uh actually i have an answer for you then um <laughs> hold on Flipping through pages. Let's see. If you want to make just the most asinine damaging gun possible. Okay, here we go. You'll want the bigger bullets mod, which uh, adds 3d6 to the damage. Um, and probably pair that with the blunderbuss mode mod, which adds another d6 per bullet fired mm -hmm. so you're probably looking at if you do that to an auto rifle or a pistol i mean and this is if you, you this is your way of having fun you get one bullet per magazine but you're probably doing an additional six or seven d6 easily of damage mm -hmm. so there is your quick guide based off the developer's memory on how to make the bfg yeah um and in in that regard another another bit of craziness that i'd be interested to see how you, how you do it because i love what i love powerful but dangerous we dangerous weaponry in my campaigns so how would you handle the noisy cricket from men in black right yes okay so knowing its size first of all we've got a mod i don't remember the name i could flip through if you really want to know but it allows the weapon to shrink one size category when not in use so if you take a pistol or a hand cannon uh or an smg i think are three smallest of them mm -hmm. and apply that it's going to go down to noisy cricket size and you can keep it in your breast pocket or uh something similar when you're walking around uh, at the same time, you'll probably want... Um, now you're making me think. I don't remember the whole list. Um, sorry, thinking. Uh, oh, you'll probably want inborn refraction, which will cause a slight area damage around where it goes. Um... Maybe overcharged shot for additional D6 of damage with a laser weapon. And... 
you'd probably just have to retitle retitle the damage type from laser to sonic or something because yeah i mean our two weapon types are laser and kinetic mm -hmm. um with kinetic being i mean it exists but it's also like your grandpappy's gun from the war they're older they're harder to find um but yeah We've got a lot of options that allow for your weapon to uh, be customized mm -hmm. um, with what it can do. We tried not to make it too dependent on just add a D6, take a D6, whatever it may be. Um, I'm curious how you'd ha how you given that I'm curious how you how you'd handle um, recoil. Okay, so we handle recoil by giving each. Uh, gun a rate of fire and that's how many times you can shoot per attack action um, so you know in standard D&D &D, you've got free action swift move uh, and standard actions right mm -hmm. uh, we kind of looked at that and what we've seen in other games and instead what if we said you had three thirds to your turn and we broke down some of it to say an attack is two-thirds, a uh, movement is one-third, and you can take all these various components with their third cost and uh, build up to your three-thirds turn total. Mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, it is likely to function the same as saying this is a standard, this is a swift, this is a whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but we thought it gave it a bit more of a unique feel. Um, and so it, you can take your rate of fire and there's a penalty for each shot you make past the first. Mm -hmm. So I don't think this is the right number, but, uh, you've got a, you know, clean shot on the first one. And then the second shot is 10% harder to hit. Third mm -hmm. shot is 20% harder than the first shot to hit so on and so forth. And there are mods to up your rate of fire. Like the SMG, we designed with the intent of not really doing anything to a normal person, but just chewing through shields like nobody's business. Because each character, unless they build uh, relatively unintelligently or in a way I haven't predicted, will have two health bars, their natural health and their shield health. Mm-hmm. Now, given would it be given what you mentioned about um about recoil penalties after the first shot, um, is that re is that recoil penalty smaller or is it smaller with lighter weapons or is it or is it about the same? It's uh, a singular number for all weapons unless you modify it to be different with uh, weapon mods or um, body mods. All right. Now, when it now um when it comes to character when it comes to characterization as as you kind of hinted at with the with the penalty, I note I I had noticed that you're using a percentile die system. Um, yes. Now what? Now um while while it's cert while I'm certainly going to be hearing happy noises from some of my colleagues like Stormforger, <laughs> um. What prompted you? What prompted you to use that system? So we initially started uh, building this uh, with a D10 system, just mm -hmm. a D10, and it felt odd as we played it. It worked; it was good, and uh, we could have shipped it that way, but it just didn't feel right to me, and. Um, I'm also a bit of a lazy DM, so having to know all the, uh, you know, here's your target number, here's a combat number, here's your contested role, it kind of got exhausting. Mm -hmm. uh, and my brother, the other designer of the game, uh, we arbitrarily, I think we were on a plane or in a line for something, we made like a 15-page pamphlet on a... Um, isekai game my little brother he, he was very deep into reading those sort of manga mm -hmm. um and we jokingly brought up what is the most over the top dice rolling system for this overly simplistic thing we can do 
and we came up with percentiles uh, because we'd played, I think, about two months prior to that, a game of the uh, Warhammer Fantasy Fourth Edition, mm-hmm. and so the way that we did it and ultimately liked and how I reworked Swords and Spaceships is you have, I believe, 19 stats in Swords and Spaceships. And every individual experience point can raise the stat by one um, to a maximum of, I think I said, 120. And so you have to roll at or below with your percentile die to achieve whatever you're trying to do. Mm-hmm. That way it's less work for the DM. You can see direct growth for the players. And honestly, I thought after uh, playing with it a little bit, it turned out really fun and easy to keep going with. Mm-hmm. Um, and with taking taking that and taking that into uh, into account, what given what you mentioned, um, are you going with are you going with a full free form type of character creation? Or are you going are, are you going um, something a little more archetype based the way, since you mentioned Warhammer Fantasy, that kind of does it with its career system. Or are, we you, are, or are you doing something else? We're currently freeform, where um, character creation is a very quick and easy process to the point that you can all do it within like 10 minutes, including your initial gear shopping, and then get playing. Uh, you... Pick your starting race. We have five, but I believe there are four people in our Kickstarter that I am super grateful to that backed us at a level that they will be designing additional races of the galaxy. So those will be added uh, for our first edition run. So you'll have a total of nine races that you could choose from. Or make your own. That's fine. Um, Because I had somebody ask can this function as a Mass Effect game? And yeah, you could absolutely reskin things and make it a, a Mass Effect game. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, you pick one of your ultimately nine races. You uh, assign your skill points, your starting skill points, uh, between your 19 skills, which is a direct representation of what your character is good at, uh, knowing that if it's below... We're still arguing if it's 20 or 25. Um, even attempting a roll, failed or success, will increase that up to the 20 or 25. You pick your dominant hand, you shop and write a backstory and get playing. We didn't want it to be a drag to make a character. We wanted it to be just what is the simplest way that we can represent who you are on the field and let the role play and the game take over not trying to overly constrain the players and i think that they will see some of the skills on there and decide um you know if they're more of a brawler type they're gonna more heavily invest in unarmed or if they're uh i guess we can look at the criminal type maybe instead of focusing on guns They'll work on their knife play and their uh, criminal skills, which we've uh, compiled under Ledger Domain. Mm-hmm. Uh, or if they're a hacker, they'll focus more down computers or first aid if they want to be a doctor and have to rely on surgical kits if they ever need to treat somebody with an injury bad enough to require surgery. Uh, so we, you know, we, we haven't really had more than six players take a look at it so far. But what our intent is and what we're hoping to see is that people will take these skills and kind of form their own classes out of it. Mm -hmm. But there is nothing in the rules preventing you from being a generalist or provided your character and game survive long enough to get everything to the max rank. And you're just a party of really incredible people. Yep. Cause you know, it's, it's no fun to put a limit on things. Mm hmm. And with with that kind of thing in mind, I've mentioned this in other interviews, but a lot of games have some form of an extra effort system in some in in some limited capacity. Um, since you mentioned Warhammer Fantasy, the um, the example in that has always been the has always been the fortune pool. Um, right. 
do you have anything in that regard, or is or is that not or is that not in the uh, cards? Um, honestly, it could be. It just completely passed by my mind upon uh, designing the game, uh, especially since we've changed the core die system, and I had to try and figure out, okay, how do I get person to person combat to work? How can I make melee weapons a at least semi-viable choice in a dominantly gun game. How do I make the spaceships interesting and handle zero G versus having gravity? And so we we didn't really want to go over the top. And um, the you know drama die, fortune die, whatever it may be, uh, just kind of whizzed right by us without consideration. Um, but, I mean, you're one of my uh, Kickstarter backers. Mm -hmm. You know that I intend to get uh, what I'm calling the Gamma copy out to uh, the backers. I think 64 of you are at a level where you'll be able to play it mm -hmm. with your friends and hopefully get some feedback from you guys. And if there's enough people that are like, hey, where's your fortune system? Where's your action points, your drama die? Well, it's no trouble for us to sit down and help make the best game we can and come up with whatever it may be called and give it to you guys. Uh, all right, I got all right, I got you. Now, when it comes to when it come you mentioned that you mentioned that you're try that you're trying to go for a degree of lethality. Um and I'm curious how how that's going to be represented. Some do some do it through some do it through critical hit um, hits. Some do it through a um, a wound system of escalating penalties, and some have completely different approaches. Um, what's your what's your setup when it comes to reinforcing that reinforcing that combat is not is not going to be the most pleasant of affairs, and certainly not the most easy of affairs. So. Uh, we've actually done a couple things for that, and we've redefined that it's not necessarily lethality, but high risk, where you're not necessarily going to die, but you're not going to love walking out of it. So, I, I mentioned briefly before that characters will, in essence, have two health pools, their natural health and their shields, mm -hmm. um, where your shields can be really quickly replenished between fights, but your natural health your own pool that takes time to recover uh, will not easily replenish between fights unless you fight days and days apart. Uh, and we made that decision after, you know, reading uh, certain stories. Like the one that I felt influenced by in making the decision is um, uh, Jim Butcher's Dresden Files, how Harry just gets the shit kicked out of him and has to keep going if the drama takes place over one to three days um so we've got the slow restoring natural health so you see your safety net not be as there as it really should be and gives you that pause of jumping in the fight and we've also got critical wounds um which I, I think that's the old name. I think we changed it to Lingering Wounds, uh, where if a percentage of your natural health is removed in a single hit, and I think we did 33%, 66%, and 100%, you receive a Lingering Wound, which will require uh, medical aid and time to go away. Uh, and these can range from, you know, broken bones to lost limbs or eyes to instant death to whatever it may be. We're in the process of reevaluating these to make them not an expansive list because I think we had um, uh, like 40 different wounds initially, and we're like, all right, this is too much. Let's let's come up with a far more simplified here's the things that can happen to you i don't um, i don't think you want to i given the fact that you're trying to go for simplicity in this 
I get the feeling that go that um le that leaning too much into the critical hit tables from Dark Heresy or God help you um Roll Master, even though I like Roll Master, is, we um is not we, something we were that's leaning advisable. heavily into the um the Witcher tabletop game style uh critical table, which is you know we looked at it and went I think we just straight up stole these let's let's fix this. Uh, <laughs> which, I mean, it happens when you're really digging something and you're like, oh, that was a really good idea, and you accidentally pull from it a bit too much, but I'm just glad that we caught the um, the accidental copying before release and get the opportunity to rectify it and make it more unique to us. Mm -hmm. Um. Now, when it now when it comes to given the fact that you're going freeform, would it be fair to say that when it comes to advancement, that's a experience as currency kind of approach? Yes, that's exactly what it is. And so, what we did is um, after every session, there is a ten question questionnaire that each player will have to individually answer uh, and answer as a group. And these questions are. Um, God, where where did I leave them? Uh, give me one second to scroll through my page. It's a long document. Um, where are you? Because I know I jotted down the 10 that I really, really wanted to use. Because I thought that it helped everyone lead to a better game overall. Okay, so here they are. Um, the first one being uh, almost a guaranteed point for everybody, but also good review. It's, did you have fun? Uh, the second being, did the Overlord, the DM, have fun? You know, that's essentially two points per session that hopefully you're getting for free. Um, it's, you know, did you survive a combat? Did you have a near-death experience? Did you convince someone of something? Did you learn something new and significant? Did you contribute something new to the lore? We're just trying to encourage people to really be a part of the world that they're playing instead of just looking at, you know, street thugs and saying, oh, look, free XP. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, take that opportunity to grow in a... Uh, the more organic way where the more you're a part of your world, the more everyone's enjoying themselves, the stronger your characters will get. Oh, all right. Now, with that kind of thing, with that kind of thing in mind, um, I'd like to ask a bit on ship combat. Yes. Because that's one of those things that can very easily spiral into the crunchier end of the, end of the spectrum if one is not careful. Definitely um, out started that way. Uh, my beta testers basically straight up told me this is not fun, and you know that hurt, but we tried to fix it. Mm -hmm. um, so the way we handle ship combat is uh, we kind of broke up the ship, where. Well, first of all, there's two ways you can play it. Either you've got your crew aboard a single ship, or each player has their own ship. So I can use Star Wars again. You're either all aboard the Millennium Falcon, or you're all in your own X-Wing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, in the instance of you're all in your own X-Wing, while well, you're controlling where you're going, you've got your gun arc, um, and you're essentially just in a sense, doing normal combat, but in space. Um, and you can repair your ship, your shields. You've got that inherent go-to. Uh, in a larger ship, where your whole crew is on board the one, uh, you've got more of a division of roles, mm -hmm. where you can't necessarily have everybody controlling the ship, right? So we tried to break it down into three pieces, which is piloting, engineering, and gunnery, where you've got someone... It, it becomes a group discussion. Mm -hmm. You've got a character in charge of each thing, but you as a unit are making decisions for the ship. 
Uh, so you've got someone in charge of piloting, which will be, you know, movement of the ship and evasive maneuvers. Gunnery is obviously firing the cannons and uh, the smaller turrets. And engineering, we've actually split into two, uh, where, you know, the more engineers, the better, in a sense, so that they can work to repair the ship's hull itself or work to bring some shields back online and give you that buffer space as you go. Mm -hmm. um, but again, as we wanted things to be dangerous, it is very possible for it to not go your way. Um, and the thing we found in testing was, uh, well, basically, people, our testers played bumper spaceships because we accidentally made a... Uh, ramming just a little too strong uh which hopefully we fix we haven't tested the fix yet unfortunately oh i see i um, see that i see that you had a um so in the, in other words you had you had a few too many players who preferred the ludic path in star sector yeah they, they're just like okay i'm gonna hit that thing over there with your gun no with my face it's like, <laughs> okay that's supposed to be a little bit mutually assured destruction and then I realized that it's absolutely not. So I hope we fix that accordingly. But, you know, it, it, it may... <laughs> we'll see how it goes. So we tried to uh, make space battles uh, really defined and detailed initially. And it was boring as hell. And... Um, now we've tried to make them a bit more frenetic and uh, less common. So in instances where you're in a space fight, it is more than ever both parties risking their lives. And, you know, historically, most fights are not to the death. So we want that to be a consideration for running games and role-playing. And um, we've debated introducing a um, morale system uh, but have concerns it'll add it'll slow things down a bit too much um, where either the players or the uh, enemies may decide at some point this isn't worth it anymore mm -hmm. um, and space fights are in essence both parties going all right, this is... Someone is more than likely not walking away from here. Um, but there are still ways to get out of it. Like, we've introduced, uh, you know, um, drama-introducing systems where you can work to take an emergency warp jump out of the fight, mm -hmm. but nobody knows where you're going to end up. It, it's kind of a random launch, and so that gives the uh the overlord the opportunity to go oh okay well let's just say you're now in the middle of enemy airspace but they don't know you're here and your warp drive broke because you did an emergency jump so you have to land on a hostile planet fix your ship with parts you don't have and get home so we try to create opportunity mm -hmm. now as far as as far as the as far as the book size itself, what are you shooting for for a um, page count? Um, honestly, I have not thought about page count. It's just going to be whatever um, supports the rules that we need to put in paper. Uh, right now, I believe, as we discussed before the interview, even mm -hmm. I'm at a hundred and five pages with no art and very minimal lore so i'm expecting by the time i get everything in there we'll probably be at um i'm gonna guess 115 to 135 pages i you know don't take that as gospel but it's a strong guess All right, all right, I can I can certainly um, I can certainly go I can certainly go with that. <laughs> um, 
And don't don't worry. I know I I know I made the joke before we went live about about the whole flogging thing. Don't worry, you're fine. Um, <laughs> you know, as um, and it's and if if worse if worse comes to worse, I'll just put in the I'll just put in a few bookmarks myself and send it back. <laughs> oh yeah, I know how irritating it all can be uh, with no bookmarks. So mm. uh, I want to try and take the chance to put those in myself. Um, but I also, you know, I'm torn with, uh, at least the gamma edition because I want to get it to my backers faster, uh, but taking the time to do the bookmarks and figure all that out will add a bit more delay to it. But because work got a little unexpectedly crazy on me this weekend, I'm already delaying getting you guys the gamma rules for another day or two. So I might as well. Uh, figure out the bookmarks make make life a little bit cleaner. Mm -hmm. But and all, and furthermore, what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Not a not a not a finalized release date, but a general idea. Well, we um, initially, I was very hopeful for July, um, and I believe. That we are still on track for July or uh, early August. Excuse me, I, I think I might sneeze. Uh, nope, okay, went away, maybe, who knows. Uh, July or early August um, for our release. And it'll really depend on um, what errors are found with the gamma copy and how long it takes artists to get um, get the art back to us. So we, we have a very limited art supply at the moment, um, which we can now grow thanks to the Kickstarter. And so we hope to have you know a couple plates spinning all at once to have the art going to get the backers that uh, wanted lore additions or um, racial additions uh, to be working with us to have people playing the Gamma Edition and telling us what they think, where are our problem spots, and what's fun, what can we lean into. And so I think July is, you know, it's a, it's a quick goal, but I hope it's a realistic goal because we've, uh, we've kind of been sitting on the project or um, I think our first Kickstarter attempt, it didn't fly, mm -hmm. uh, was in 2019. Um, and that was before the die rework. So we've, we've been working on this for a while, and um, we're just really excited to get it out and get it in players' hands, and it's, it's been incredibly exciting. All right, I, I, and I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how the project of how the project develops with time. Um, and and whatever shenanigans end up end up happening, because we all know that the dice gods hate everybody. Oh, obviously, and you know, I've I've been told uh, consolingly already that it will take about eight hours of players having the game in a meta build will already show up and i'm like but i tried so hard not to uh so even yeah the, even the pro even even the biggest pros who try and claim that they didn't build with didn't build for a meta a meta is not a matter of if but when it's all when yep i i can't stop it but i tried to make it less immediately accessible the first version of the meta was own a sniper rifle. That seemed too easy. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's it's more the issue is the issue is when it gets stupid easy for a for a meta to um, show up. Um, yeah, I'm sure it'll be easy because it's all still going to be what gun and what mods get you there. Um, and I'd say I'd I'd honestly say that the people who are go who are going to be fishing for metas versus the people who are going to be playing for 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 a kind of narrative um the latter is going to be is going to be more frequent you might see the former yes. you might see the former a bit but not but um i don't think you're going to be dealing with pun pun levels of bullshit <laughs> yeah well you know i it'll be what it be 
<laughs> and, you know, one thing I'd love to do is I want to try and keep an open channel between us and the players mm -hmm. so if there's a stupid broken weapon that comes out or just a really fun build like an example one that i've used is i call it the lava belcher and it basically turns your smg into a uh, uh lava spewing blunderbuss with a tiny bit of reflavoring on our fire mods um we want to be able to essentially keep a open pamphlet of who are, you know, the mythical heroes of the galaxy? What are the legendary firearms? And uh, what what is a mythic ship that people see or, you know, had a significant role in a war? And so we just want to keep an open channel. And in a sense, instead of just, here's the book, and I don't know how feasible this will be, but, you know, we all dream big. Um, I want to be able to kind of keep a living world between the players up kept which which makes sense and that, like i said i'm definitely going to be looking forward to to seeing how that how that develops with time for sure and a a small part of the motivation for wanting to do that was um you know i mean obviously there's just the the huge interest in letting everybody have a bit of a say in it without it getting overwhelming um but at the same time, I can absolutely, and this is, you know, something that I shouldn't admit, but I can take the most broken stuff and say, oh, it's a legendary firearm. Go find that specifically instead. <laughs> All right, I gotcha. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing how the community develops and... Mm -hmm. Um, I don't recall exactly when you joined the, the Discord for Swords and Spaceships, which, um, I'll give you a link for to put in the description of the YouTube video. Mm -hmm. Um, but one of my beta testers and I had, were talking a little bit in there about our expansion ideas. And we, uh, you know, we already have some thoughts on things we'd love to do if there's interest and... Mm -hmm. You know, first and foremost, uh, well, I should say that, you know, it, it probably sounds shitty that it's like, oh, I already have expansion ideas and the base game's not out. Uh, that's it's, just because... It's not, as, it's not as shitty as you might think. Yeah, we, we needed to focus on getting the game out, and if we wanted to do all of this in the base book, I don't think we could have given things the appropriate attention. So some of the expansion ideas are, you know, introducing magic to the system or uh, fleet combat or space monsters or one of them, because I was playing too much Red Dead at that point. But, um, you know, there's stuff we would love to be able to do with it. And uh, even more so now that we're doing the percentile die system, because I think that frees us up to add even more capability to the game with more ease than it was with the D10 system. All right. But with, with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come out to come all the way up to the temple and enjoy the insanity at play here oh thank you no it, it feels like home i'm happy to be here mm -hmm. and anytime you see fit to return the door is always open as i often say around here drinking is not mandatory but it is encouraged <laughs> all right well thank you so much for having me it's been a pleasure yep and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>